Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. My name is Jamie and I'll be working with you on this Exploring the Arctic lesson today. Now it's wonderful to have so many schools with us. I've got a few points of admin uh, before we get started. So first of all, the question and answer app, which I think many of you have already found, that's the side of the screen. For those of you who are posting questions, we'll come to the exploratory questions towards the end of this live lesson. But if there are any clarification, things you don't understand, please put in questions during the talk and we will try to make sure those are clearer as we go along. If you're a teacher and you'd like to have the lesson full screen at the front of the classroom, as well as see the Q&A app uh, and take part in a poll that we have too, then just make sure that you have the lesson on a second device, such as a laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Go to the same uh, lesson and you'll be able to access the Q&A and the polls while having the video full screen at the front of the classroom. It's my great delight to say that we have uh, some shout outs. We've got schools from the UK and Spain joining us today and some shout outs. We've got hello to Hawks class at Thrupp Primary in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire um, who are taking part in their first ever live lesson. Hello to everyone in Hawks class. We have Seahorse class and Robbins class at year two. Uh, and yet you swan class and they're all at Fairfield Park Lower School. Hi to everyone at Field, Fairfield Park Lower School. And um, we have a shout out to Challenger High Fire Discovery classes at Nettlebed Community School. Good morning to all the children there. Um, welcome to year three at Edgebaston High School. Uh, everyone in 2KB from Swans International Primary School and last but by no means least, we have Fox's class in Midvale Prime, Midfield sorry, Primary. And hello to all the students watching from there. Now we're going to do a few things today. We're going to have a short introduction to the Arctic. I've been going to the Arctic for 10 years now, working with science teams and exploring what's happening uh, up in the frozen north. We are then going to do an activity together, uh, looking at a special adaptation, a special characteristic feature of some of the living things in the Arctic that help them uh, cope with the cold temperatures up there. And then we'll come to the question and answer. Now, I know that um, this session is uh, about half an hour long. Uh, and, we'll, and we will finish at half an hour, but if there are lots more questions, uh, we will offer the opportunity to stay for a bit longer and go through some more questions as well. Don't forget, you can also upvote questions. Uh, if there's a question that you already want to ask that's been sent in by somebody else, just press, press the thumbs up button next to the question and that will push it up the order in which we answer them. But without further ado, um, we are now going to have a little trip to the Arctic and I want to share with you what it has been like to work up there over the past 10 years. Now, the first time I arrived in the Arctic was 10 years ago. It was in a very small plane with a very, very good pilot who landed on the sea ice. Now, the sea ice isn't like the snow you might find around your school if it's snowing or cold temperatures. It's in fact the frozen section at the top of the sea. And it's only about one and a half or two meters thick. That's about the height of a teacher. And we had a wonderful pilot who landed us on there and then flew away and we were there with the team for six whole weeks, that's about 40 days. And we're there to see how the Arctic was changing. And because we were 400 miles from the nearest habitation, from the nearest town and other people, we had to set up our own tiny little settlement. Uh, so we had some different tents. You can see the curved 
long tent. That was our mess tent. That's where we ate and we cooked. And then you can see some of the hexagonal tents. And they were used for offices or for science labs or we did our work. And it was a really beautiful, wonderful place to live and work. But it could be quite chilly. The coldest temperatures we had in our sleeping tents, we couldn't heat our sleeping tents, so smaller and it's not possible to heat them because it can release poisonous gases during the night, which are very dangerous. But waking up looked a bit frosty. So when you woke up, what happened was you'd go, oh, wake up, but all your breath, all the moisture in your breath during the night had frozen on the inside of your tent and then gave you a sort of frost shower in the morning as you woke up. So pretty chilly, down to minus 40 and below. Um, it's the same in Celsius and Fahrenheit, minus 40, but a chilly way to wake up. But it wasn't all hardship. We had uh, Took, um, a dog with us. Now, Took's not a husky. He's an Inuit camp dog. Um, and I think we're going to have a poll coming up shortly um, to give you a sense of what Took did for us. Now, Took's just found there the warmest place on camp, and that's the kitchen door. And we always had the kitchen, the mess tent heated. Now, I wonder if you can guess why we had Took with us. Was it to keep us company? Was it to be a guide dog if there were a blizzard where we couldn't see because there was so much snow and everything was white? Or do you think it was because there were lots of polar bears around and he was our polar bear guard dog to keep us safe from polar bears? wonder what you think. I wonder whether you'll get the right answer there. I don't have those scores coming up, so I'm just going to have to get a little bit of a guess. I wonder how you got on for all those classes who thought that we had a dog with us to keep us safe from polar bears. You are absolutely correct. Give yourself a big round of applause. Now, it's said that polar bears don't really like the smell of dogs. And also, if there was one close by, um, Took would give a very loud bark and would be able to release bangers to scare the bears away before they came into camp. Now, we're there for about 40 days, uh, and we didn't have a bathroom or shower room, so there's no real way of washing. So we're a bit stinky for a lot of the time, but luckily, when it's uh, very cold, you can't smell that too much. What we did, I think I had to have three baths afterwards to wash off all the grime from 40 days of being on the ice. But Helen, one of the scientists, decided, nope, this is too much. I'm going to wash my hair. Got a little bit of hot water, very small ration, and went into her tent, washed her hair, and came out and gave it a flick. It all froze completely solid. And it's that cold that your hair, if wet, would freeze instantly. Now, luckily, it doesn't snap off if you um, break it. Uh, but it made a very, very funny shape when Helen came out of the tent. And we're there, as I said, to study how the Arctic is changing. And after that first year in the Arctic, over the past seven years, except for last year and this year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, 
we've been studying up on an island which is halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole called Svalbard. Now, it's a magical place full of glaciers, big rivers of ice, mountains, and we take a small plane from the main airport across the mountains to the small science village of Nyolesund. Nyolesund used to be a coal mining settlement, so that's where people would mine for coal, but has now turned into a village where scientists from around the world come and live and work. And one of the buildings there is the UK's Arctic Research Station. And that's essentially our home when we're in the Arctic studying the animals and the environment, the habitat of the Arctic, the ice, the waters, the land. And in this small building, we have storerooms where we can keep our boats and all our equipment. We have spaces to do science called laboratories, and we have bedrooms and a hot shower and a real loo. So these are all wonderful things. And it's a very, very nice place to do science from. And if you're very lucky when you're up there in March or spring or, or the winter, then there's an opportunity to see something called the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis. And this is a, almost a sort of like a natural firework display, these great curtains of green, and purple and red light. You almost think they should make sounds so they shimmer across the sky and sometimes fill the entire sky, as you can see in the photograph on your screen. And it's just simply a wonderful, wonderful sight. But we're not there just to have a look at the wonderful scenery. We're also studying how the Arctic is changing. You can see here that we're, we're on a boat on the bit of water by the research station and we're dragging a net behind us. This is to find out if there's any tiny fragments, tiny pieces of plastic that may have come from Europe, from Britain, maybe even from near where you live and fallen into the sea and the ocean currents have taken it up towards the Arctic. So we're searching for those tiny fragments using a net that we pull through the Arctic waters. Other times we're up on a glacier and we're also seeing if any pollution or other particles carried on the air can be brought to the Arctic and change how it works. It's not always really nice weather. Sometimes it's pretty tricky weather when you're in the Arctic, sometimes it's blowing really strong winds, the snow's in your face and it's very hard to see, and you're in the middle of a glacier doing work beside a very big hole. So this is uh, Blair and Jane, two of the science team from a few years ago. And next to that hole is, an, in fact, if you go through that hole on a rope, you're abseiling or rappelling down, you end up in this beautiful ice cavern and we are studying inside the ice, finding out how it's changing. Yeah. Stunningly beautiful, it's about 40 meters down, and then after you've done your work, 40 meters back up again, and it's quite hard work. So the 40 meters down is quite exciting as you look over the edge and you see this great chasm beneath you. But then coming back up, you have to pull yourself up that rope using a technique called jumaring, and you get all the way up to the top, 40 meters, that's about the height of a 10-story building. So a lot of work at the end of each day. And then you might get home, have some supper in the canteen, and if you're very lucky, through the window, you might spot a little friend like this Arctic fox coming to say hello. So that's a very brief introduction to the Arctic. And what I want to do now is a little activity with you to show how animals are suited to live in this part of the world, this cold northern part of the world. Now, for this, you're going to need um, some ice in a container uh, mixed with a little bit of water. And then we're going to see whether the adaptation of some animals actually keeps you warmer. 
So we're going to make what I'm calling a blubber glove. Okay. So I've got two bags and in between them, I've put some fat. Do you think that animals in the Arctic might have fat or extra layers? Let's look at a couple to see what they might look like. So the first up, we might have a polar bear or a walrus. They've got lots of those adaptations, a thick layer of fat around them to keep them warm. We might be able to see other things that help, to help them survive in the cold temperatures as well. So what we're going to find out, does that layer of fat actually keep you warm? So we're going to do this by first of all putting a bare hand in a bucket of icy water to see how long I can hold it there. Then we're going to try with a blubber glove and see if I can hold it even longer. Is the blubber going to keep me warmer? So hopefully you have everybody ready to try along with me. There is a particularly messy way of doing this, which I don't advise ever, which is just to smear fat like a margarine all over your hand and then put it in. But I don't recommend that. It's far too messy. So everyone together, I'm going to put this hand on Ellie, who might give us a wave, who's behind the camera. Is going to time me. Okay, Ellie, are you ready to time to see all together how long we can keep a hand in the icy waterfall without a glove on? And just to those children watching, if it does feel very painful, do take it out. This isn't an endurance test <laughs> to, to see whether we can freeze your hand and turn it blue. Um, this is a chance to just get an idea of the difference between having a blubber glove, having blubber cup covering you, or having just a bare hand. So I'll take my lead from Ellie. I'm just gonna put my hand in the, in the ice bucket next to me. And when Ellie says go, she'll start counting me down. Okay, I'm gonna give you, uh, see if you can do 30 seconds, starting in three, two, one, go. Oh, that's cold. It's actually quite, it was a very hot day today, so it's actually quite, but it's beginning to hurt. And you'll find that if you work in the Arctic a lot, the, the cold can be very painful. And painful, almost like a wild animal, sort of like stinging or clawing at you. This is actually, wow, this is colder than I thought it would be. And I've got a big ache on my hand. You have to be very careful wearing lots of gloves when you work in the Arctic, because you can get frostbite very quickly and um, I'm hoping that I'm very 30 seconds that's, already that's 30 seconds you want to try it longer I'm not really I don't <laughs> want to try too much longer because it's quite painful already shall I try what 40 48 sounds like a good number I wonder how you're getting on in the classroom Eesh. Uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. 48, please say for it's 48. Two, one, there you go. That's 48. Oh, wow, that was chilly. I was going to nurse my hands back to health. Oh, so I wonder how long you managed to keep your hand in the water and in the classroom. So, next up, so here we have my blubber glove. And I'm hoping that my blubber glove, this layer of fat, is going to keep my hand warmer and I'll try and beat 48 seconds. Does this give you a chance to get everything in order? Ellie will give me a countdown very shortly and we'll see whether those animals, the walrus and the polar bear, have got it right. And I'm going to count down very shortly. Okay, three, two, one, go. <laughs> Oh, that's quite nice. That's very pleasant. Maybe I should be a walrus. Or a polar bear. 
or a, or a whale, another example of an animal with a thick layer of blubber. We could be here all day. Oh, a little bit of cold coming through. How long should how long do I just go until I, I, I it gets painful again? See if I you can beat, beat forty eight. See if I can beat forty eight seconds. Okay, I wonder how you're getting on in the classroom. I'm seeing if I can beat forty eight seconds. I could probably hold my hand here based on how it's going on for the rest of this lesson. That's forty eight. Forty eight done. Easy. Easy, easy, easy. Interesting fact. Uh, the longest recorded swim by a polar bear was nine days in a row, which is pretty amazing. For, I think, for walrus, they can go down for a very long time to depths of, I think, 60 to 90 meters in these cold waters, hunting for sort of clams and other food on the bottom using the bristly, bristly whiskers. I'm going to conclude here the blubber keeps you warmer in icy water. I wonder how you've got on. I wonder whether you found out the same thing. This is this is great. I'm just going to keep my hand here for this rest <laughs> for the rest of this live lesson and see see how we get on because I think it's going to be minutes. But I'm going to come to some of these amazing questions you've been putting in here. So do keep them coming. Um, Nettle Bed Community School. Great question coming up first off. Has the Arctic always been covered with snow and ice? Uh, no, it hasn't um, always been covered with snow and ice. There have been dinosaurs. Um, the dinosaurs, in fact, related to velociraptors. Um, if the, uh, anyone who's touched on or heard about Jurassic, um, Jurassic Park, um, there's some amazing um, dinosaurs being found up in the Arctic, so it hasn't always um, been covered in snow and ice. Um, in fact, it um, became this level of coverage over the past um, about 15,000, 20,000 years where we had the last sort of um, big ice age and it's been slowly retreating uh, since then. Um, question from Matthew. Um, have you seen any wildlife? Um, Matthew, it's a great question. We see uh, quite a lot of wildlife, more if we go later on in the year, so in sort of May, June. So the types of wildlife we see, uh, we see whales, so humpback, ooh, was it humpback? No, minke whale, blue whale and beluga whale, the, the white whale of the Arctic um, we've seen up there. Uh, we have seen um, this polar bear when we were up in Canada. Um, there was Arctic foxes, reindeer on Svalbard, and a host of bird life. Uh, so uh, little orcs, one of my favourite, A-U-K. Um, we have seen eider ducks, um, where traditionally the feathers for eider downs come from. Um, we have seen um, Arctic terns. Uh, we have seen um, fulmers up there, uh, seals up there, ringed seals up, up in the Arctic. Uh, so a really lovely uh, range of wildlife um, that we encounter. But as, as the, the sun comes back, and there's more sort of like algae plant life in the waters, then you get more life around. The next question is from Fairfield Park. Um, what is my favorite animal that lives there? That's a great question. Now I've listed a whole range of wildlife that lives in the Arctic, but my, uh, which we've seen, but my favorite animal um, in the Arctic is one that I've never seen, it's a narwhal. And the narwhal is a cross uh, between uh, a sort of dolphin uh, or small whale and a unicorn. So epically brilliant, um, the narwhal. Um, now we're my favorite animal um, in the Arctic. Uh, next question is from Barrett. What is the rarest animal that you've seen in the Arctic? It's a really good question. Um, it could be the polar bear. There's only about 25,000 polar bears in the world. Um, it might be the blue whale, which are quite rare up in the Arctic, or maybe the beluga whale, which are also quite rare. 
Um, so one, one of those ones will probably be the rarest that we have seen in the Arctic. From Rushmore Primary School, <laughs> brilliant question, how do polar bears catch their dinner? Um, so polar bears uh, stalk, so creep up on seals when they're on the sea ice uh, and try and catch them then. Uh, and so the sneaky, sneaky polar bear crawl. Um, and also increasingly, because there is less sea ice now, when they come over the mountains sort of towards um, sort of that way, so they're all over that way um, during the winter and they come over to this side of Svalbard during the summer, quite often they'll be um, eating eggs, so bird eggs, so birds that are nesting um, around here, and maybe even some little chicks or fledglings um, too. Um, it's far less energy they're getting from those than they'd get from a seal, so they have to eat sort of more and more, and, and even then can still be a little bit hungry. But it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, this is from 2P, um, Lofthouse Gate uh, and in Wakefield. How many animals live in the Arctic? Lots and lots and lots and lots. That's a great question. I don't know when anybody's ever counted them. If we take an animal like the polar bear, for instance, the, the estimates of the number of polar bears in the world is between 20,000 and 30,000. So you can see there's quite a big difference between those two numbers. And that's because counting animals is really, really tricky. You've got to um, count where they are in a few places and then try and see whether you can make that, you know, use that to guess how many there are animals there are in total. So it's a very, very tricky um, number to calculate. If you take one of the tiniest animals to live in the Arctic, uh, the copepod, which is a tiny uh, shrimp-like animal that's sort of about the size of a of a um, exclamation mark in a book. <sighs> now, if you've got a whiteboard in your classroom, here here's a task for the teachers. In the whole ocean, but they are in the Arctic too. There are an estimated one thousand three hundred and forty-seven billion billion. Um, so that's one, three, four, seven, and then 18 zeros, um, copepods in the world's ocean. So working out how many animals there are is really, really tricky. Um, but it's, it's something that if you continue to study science, you'll learn more and more about. But it's a great, great question. Um, here we are from Throp Primary. How did you travel to the Arctic and how long did it take? It's a great question. Um, Getting to the ice base, so those first bases on, on the ice, um, we, is, is flying. So we flew from London um, to Ottawa, um, the capital of Canada, and then which was a day, and then we took smaller and smaller planes for another day, all the way up through Canada, so to Akaliwit, the capital of Nunavut, um, the Inuit province in, in, in um, or First Peoples province in, in Canada, then from there to Arctic Bay and then to Resolute Bay and then a tiny plane all the way onto the ice. To get to Svalbard, again, it's flying from London to Oslo, the capital of Norway, then from Oslo to the main town, Longyearbyen and Svalbard, and then a tiny plane over. So it's, it's between two and four days to get to the Arctic by plane. Um, so it's not too difficult, but it's still quite, quite a long way. Um, from Lisgard Primary, how would humans adapt to living in the Arctic? That's a great, great question. Uh, so humans have been in the Arctic for thousands of years. Um, normally, they sort of move with the sort of the retreat of the ice. So you've had um, indigenous peoples in Russia and in Greenland and in Canada and in, in, in Alaska. Um, as well as the, the north of Scandinavia, so countries like um, Sweden and Finland and Norway. Um, and they have adapted, humans tend to adapt to places through uh, behavior change. So they hunt different animals or have hunted different animals. Um, they've used those animals um, to make clothes. Um, so seal um, skins and polar bear fur and everything else been, and reindeer have been used to make clothes. Um, and so you have the, the fur from those animals to keep you warm. And then the diet 
um, as well in the housing. So igloos and, and teepee-like structures for the Nanet in, 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 in Russia, igloos for the Inuit in, in Greenland and, and Canada, um, and different shelters to keep warm, as well as also, um, I'm going to take my hand out of here, as well as, um, I'm just remembering what I was talking about, which was the, 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 the diet um, that you have, um, which is a very sort of fatty diet, um, because that has a lot of the energy um, per, per gram than any other type of food. So lots of different ways that humans have adapted to living in the Arctic. Um, <laughs> great question, how does the fat stop you um, getting cold? Um, really, really good question. It's, it's, it's really about um, energy transfer. Um, so heat is like energy. And so essentially it acts um, like, a, like a barrier to stopping the heat um, from your hand, um, becoming this, your hot hand becoming the same temperature as the cold water. So those two balancing out, that's what it really wants to do um, in nature is that if you put a hot hand in cold water, those two things will try and become the same temperature. And by putting that layer of fat in the way you slow down how those two are becoming the same temperature. It's the same idea in how um, a thermos works and also the same idea in warm clothing and especially nice puffy um, clothing that you might wear during the winter. <laughs> um, Fairfield Park School would like to know why are polar bears white? Fairfield Park School and any of everybody else watching, polar bears are not white. Polar bears are in fact a sort of creamy color and their skin is black. And they have black skin to absorb as much heat from the sun as possible. And they have this creamy off-white fur so that they're camouflaged, so that the same color as the surrounding environment. And when we're talking about what their dinner is, this helps them sneak up on their prey, the seal, more easily. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to answer one more question. And then we'll sort of have a formal end. And then anyone who'd like to, to, to stay on, I'm very happy to, to answer, so try and answer some more questions for about 10 minutes. Um, so, Edgbaston High School, 3L, how many polar bears have you seen? Well, we had two polar bears um, at the end of the runway uh, um, in the Canadian Arctic. But since then, I haven't seen any. I was hoping to see some this summer um, when we were due to return um, to swell by as you see more polar bears in this area during the summer. Um, they tend to be over the other side of the island during the winter. Um, great question from Rushmore Primary School. What do seals eat? Um, seals tend to eat fish. Um, so an example of a fish up in the Arctic waters traditionally has been the Arctic cod, which has sort of like an antifreeze in its blood to stop it from freezing. But as the seas are getting warmer around here, you're also finding fish that you might normally find around the coast of the UK. Um, and you might even find in shops near where you live, such as Atlantic cod and mackerel. So it's got a more varied diet now. Uh, um, class three um, would like to know how explorers get hot water in the Arctic. While class through, we take fuel with us to warm the water. If we're camping, it's a really, really important thing. We mainly to just melt it rather than have it hot, melt it so that we can drink. Um, so we're not sort of sort of melting water, but we're, we're putting snow in the top of a, of a um, snow melter. And then we're using uh, fuel to heat that up and to make that into water so we have something to drink. And then for a tiny, tiny bit of that, we'll heat it up even more um, for washing the dishes and a little bit, um, maybe for a hot water bottle in the evening. And there is a power plant um, in the science village that you saw in the photographs earlier. And so that provides heating and hot water for all the bases around. Um, what would the camp dog do if he saw an Arctic fox? 
Um, and that's from Mia at Edgbaston High School. <laughs> uh, probably a lot of barking and running um, would be involved. In fact, we had a lemon, uh, it's like, a bit like an Arctic hamster, tiny wee rodent uh, that ran across our camp and Took thought that was great fun. Uh, but eventually we had to grab hold of Took and, and let the lemming run off um, to safety. So I'm not quite sure. Um, I think they'd probably all go and hide the Arctic foxes if, if, if dogs were around. Um, so um, here at Nettlebed Community School, I have seen a white pheasant. Um, is it an Arctic animal? Uh, not really. So pheasants um, really come from Asia. Um, a lot of the pheasants that we sort of have in the UK um, have been brought over from sort of Burma-China border areas um, and from other parts of, of sort of East Asia. Um, it's not a native um, bird uh, to Britain. Um, and so a, a white pheasant would be an example. I've, in fact, seen a white pheasant in the wild um, on the, in sort of t Tibet China border um, in, in, in northern Yunnan um, a number of years ago. So that, that, that's, that's where they, they come from. Um, what is the longest time you've stayed in the Arctic? Um, that's 2C Lofthouse Gate um, Wakefield. Um, longest time I've stayed in the Arctic has been eight weeks, um, which was a fantastic experience, um, but um, pretty chilly for a long time. I think we've got time for um, one or two more questions. So have many people traveled to the Arctic? And that's from 2P uh, Lofthouse Gate in Wakefield. Uh, 2P, there are 4 million people who live in the Arctic. Uh, and about 12 million, if you count the wider sort of sort of what's called the circumarctic or circumpolar region. So there are lots of people who live there. Um, and if you, as a class, want to have a look at some of the towns there, um, there's a, a large town called Murmansk, M-U-R-M-A-N-S-K in Russia, and also Tromso, um, T-R-O-M-S-O in Norway, just to give you an example of two large towns. Um, in the Arctic. Uh, and seahorse class or copepods, a type of shrimp, they're both what are called crustaceans. Um, so they are related in that way. So the same family as lobsters and crabs um, and shrimp and copepods. Thank you for your questions. They've been absolutely wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm, my favorite whale is a as a narwhal and whale family, but beluga whale, I'd say, Emily, and just, uh, just one last snuck in. Thank you so much for being part of this Exploring the Arctic lesson from AXA Arctic Live. It's been wonderful to have all your fab questions. I hope you've involved, uh, enjoyed um, being involved in investigating blubber and how it can help stay warm in the Arctic, um, especially for those animals like walrus and polar bears. But for now, it's goodbye from Arctic Live. Bye-bye.